With the Easter banking holiday now over and the coronavirus still plaguing the world, the US and China are set to release macroeconomic data shortly. And with notable corporate earnings to be announced, we discuss this and more with Bob Mason of FX Empire. Hello, Bob, and thank you once again for joining us. Let's start with the biggest headline of our lifetime. The coronavirus is having a huge effect on everyday life and the economy, of course. But how do we battle this virus and what should our traders be looking out for? Governments appear to be winning the battle to a certain extent on the coronavirus front. We're seeing a downward trend in, in the number of new cases. Um, while there's the odd day where we're seeing a pickup, in fact, on Tuesday, uh, we saw a marginal increase uh, in France and in Spain, while Italy and Germany reported a downward trend. Um, so it, it's a mixed bag, but we're definitely seeing numbers that are much lower than we saw last week and going into the last weekend. So that's a positive. The market's holding on to that quite tightly. Uh, and that supported you know, the risk appetite that we saw on Monday and Tuesday you know, across the equity markets and you know, the commodity currencies as well. Um, we're not out of the woods just yet, however. Obviously, uh, China's reported a, a sudden increase in new cases. Nothing alarming, but an increase nonetheless. And, you know, this is all coming from, you know, people coming back from abroad. And that raises the question of for how long borders are going to need to be shut down for. Um, so those expecting a sharp economic rebound, you know, they're in for a, probably for a, in for a surprise. Uh, and if you listen to the IMF, you know, it's a lot worse than many probably priced in. It's clear that we continue to watch the infection figures most of all with the coronavirus. However, we seem to have forgotten about the macroeconomic data. I mean, is there any point looking at the data or can we use historical data from the past possibly to, to guide us in the future? For sure, I mean, we're not interested in February numbers, particularly out of, you know, the EU and the US uh, and even the UK. These economies weren't hit, you know, by lockdowns and, you know, confinement measures until you know, mid to late March, really, and then you know, going obviously into April. So looking at February figures, they're not going to tell much. In fact, you know, if we're looking at things like retail sales figures as well, if we're looking at March, you know, there's going to be hoarding uh, that will sort of skew the numbers uh, to the positive, and the markets are going to have to ignore that. You're going to have to start looking at you know, April to see the full extent of the damage, and then you know, March, you know, once you've seen March and April, then you're looking at June, July, to see what effects, you know, obviously government support and monetary policy support has had, you know, on countering the effects of the lockdown, not actually supporting an economic rebound. So, yeah, you know, there are some numbers to look at. I mean, this week we've got manufacturing index numbers for April out of the US. You know, that's going to be a lot more interesting than March retail sales figures that should reflect an element of hoarding uh, rather than, you know, give investors hope if the numbers are positive. Chinese numbers seem a little bit suspicious to some participants. Um, maybe they are painting a better picture than what the actual story is. Uh, what is your opinion on this? Yeah, I mean, the economic data out of China, well, I mean, you know, the markets, if they're reliant upon that alone, would be, you know, rallying with no downside in sight. Uh, you know, we saw the manufacturing and service sector PMIs rebound from, you know, historical record lows. Uh, in, in the space of a month. And then we saw trade data for March, you know, on Tuesday uh, beat expectations and, you know, the US dollar trade surplus returning um, with less than expected drops in both exports and imports in March. Um, we're going to need to have a look at other data, however, you know, obviously looking at trade figures across its key trading partners, including, you know, the likes of Japan, the EU and the US, uh, will give a better indication of really just how things stand, um, you know, and whether it really is, in fact, as good as, you know, the Chinese numbers suggest. Uh, you know, at the end of the week, we move away from trade data and we look at first quarter GDP numbers, you know, and if we if we consider what the IMF has, has just projected for, you know, the global economy, uh, you know, if these numbers don't really shock the markets, then, you know, we, you re, we really do have some doubts on the numbers. You know, you've got retail sales and industrial production figures as well. Let's not forget that the Chinese government's looking for an in-country in, in, in rebound, as it were, um, rather than relying on, you know, exports across the globe, as it can't really when you consider the lockdown across, you know, ma major states uh, in the US and obviously, you know, 
EU member states and the UK as well. So yeah, let's have a look at Friday's numbers and obviously data from the rest of the world and its key trading partners to really get a better picture of where things stand. U.S. consumption figures mainly focus on hoarding and possible panic buying. And obviously in the grocery retail market, it's, it's quite huge at the minute. But does that paint a picture overall for the retail industry with people not having much money to go out and spend at all? So are we looking at real figures here or are we looking mainly at retail figures? Yeah, on the retail sales front, I mean, obviously we're expecting quite dire numbers. There's going to be some hoarding that will skew the numbers for, you know, non-durable goods, uh, you know, particularly grocery shopping and stuff like that. But when you when you look at, you know, the surge in, you know, the initial jobless claims that we saw over the last few weeks, um, you know, and the, the jump in the unemployment rate, obviously that's going to really have a material effect on spending. Uh, this is supposed to be uh, the lockdown is going to be the worst economic, you know, slowdown since the Great Depression, um, which is meant to dwarf the global financial crisis. So all in all, you know, no one's going to be going out spending um, other than, you know, the bare necessities. Uh, and let's obviously not forget that obviously confinement measures and lockdowns do obviously restrict people's movement. So you need to remove the non-durable goods, you know, the grocery stuff, and then have a look at, you know, what where else people have been spending money. And I hazard a guess that they've probably not been doing too much. You know, no one's going to go, go out and buy a truck. And obviously, you know, driving and stuff like that, people aren't driving around. So, you know, fuel spending and stuff like that is going to be materially lower. So the numbers are going to be quite dire. Um, and then, you know, come come April and uh, even May, uh, we're going to see even worse figures quite likely. Um, you know, we're, we're seeing weekly initial job, jobless claims numbers at six, six million. Um, you know, so there's no spending going on other than the bare essentials. So as we close for today, um, is there anything else that our traders should be looking out for? Yeah, I think finally, you know, really what to look out for. You've got to monitor the number of, um, coronavirus cases, you know, if there are any sudden clusters, you know, in large US states that haven't really been largely affected just yet, you know, that's going to have a material impact on risk appetite. Um, so that's one thing to consider, you know, and obviously a re-return almost of the numbers that we saw in the likes of Italy and so on. You know, we heard reports of people in South Korea getting infected again. So is there any um, possibility of that actually hitting the West as well? Um, you know, it's not the first time that a virus can mutate. So, you know, is that a risk that the markets need to consider? So initially, I'd, I'd look at the numbers, however, you know, the day-to-day -day figures and make sure there's no spikes anywhere and a sudden upward trend. The other thing to factor in is, of course, the IMF numbers from overnight on Tuesday, you know, the global economy is set to contract by 3%. That's, that's after having forecasted a 3.3% growth, you know, back in 2019. Um, Put it into perspective of the global financial crisis, year on year, the economy shrank by 0.1%. Uh, so, you know, 3% contractions, material. Um, and with the likes of the US, you know, forecasted for 6% contraction and the EU, you know, more than 7%. You know, I think these markets are being pretty, pretty optimistic of a V, you know, V rebound, V-shaped rebound in, in the respective economies. The IMF doesn't think so. If you look at the unemployment rates, you know, and the effect on the consumer, uh, particularly those that are driven by consumer demand, you know, they're, they're unlikely to be going shopping anytime soon. And then that's going to affect manufacturing sectors, you know, and export driven markets as well, economies as well. So, yeah, I think, you know, it's, it's pretty bullish at the moment. And, you know, I'm surprised the equity markets are actually, you know, finding any positives to hold on to at the moment. So I'll be cautious of the downside right now. Well, that's all for today, Bob. Thank you so much for joining us. That was the Midweek Market Drivers, and we will see you again next time.